welcome to Church at Home with Pearl Baptist Church. We're so glad that you are joining us this day. We begin with words from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With his mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. This morning, as part of our message here at Perot, for the, all those that were in person, I shared with the kids how God's love is so vast. It is deeper and wider than we could even ever imagine. We hope that as you worship this week, despite whatever challenges or uncertainties you're facing, that you would know the truth of God's love for you. It is beyond all measure. It is beyond all understanding and knowledge, but it is true and it is real and it is available for you. May you be blessed with God's love as you worship this week. See that you are not alarmed, 
for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All this is but the beginnings of the birth pangs. Then men, they will hand you over to be tortured, and will put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. Then many will fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase of lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the desolating sacrilege standing in the holy place, as it was spoken by the prophet Daniel, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. The one on the housetop must not go down to take what is in the house. The one in the field must not turn back to get a coat. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For at that time there will be great suffering, such as has not been seen from the beginning of the world until now, no, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no one would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and produce great signs and omens to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. Take note. I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he is in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. And immediately after the suffering of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the heavens and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. <coughs> but about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, may the words of my mouth in the meditations and reflections of all our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've always been fascinated uh, by the fact that the Bible teaches that this world of ours has a beginning and will have an ending. And what I find so fascinating is, fascinating is this is what modern science tells us. There was the Big Bang which started our world, and there will be, for lack of a better term, the Big Fire, as the ever-expanding sun transforms into a red dwarf, engulfs the planet, and melts away any evidence that this planet ever existed, sending molecules and atoms that were once Earth floating off into space. Now, logically, it seems to me, the biblical writers who wrote long before modern science should have concluded that the Earth always was and always will be. People were born and died, but the Earth itself continued on its merry way. That would have been their lived experience. But they didn't believe that. They believed, in line with modern science, that there was a beginning, and there will be an ending for this world of ours. Of course, the difference between modern science and the biblical world, besides the time differences, Enormous, is that the biblical authors tie both the beginning and the end of the world into the activity of God, which science does not. Now, at first, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures, this concept of the end of the world did not play a very important role. But over time, as you read the Old Testament, you begin to find references to it, to the end of this world and the beginning of a new world or a new age, if you will in the writings of prophets such as Isaiah, which was part of a response of reading this morning, where Isaiah wrote about a new age when the wolf would lie down with the lamb and the calf and the fat would together, and a little child would lead them. In the book of Daniel, there is a type of biblical literature, which you also see in the book of Revelation, 
known as apocalyptic literature, in which Daniel tries to discern when this new age would come into being. As he writes about a dream he had of four great beasts, the first like a lion with eagle's wings, the second like a bear with three tusks coming out of its mouth, the third like a leopard with four wings on its back, and the fourth the strongest beast of all, which had teeth of iron and ten horns on its head. Now, the imagery in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation is quite fantastical, but in some senses, at least in the book of Daniel, it's, it's a diminution of Isaiah's vision. For in Daniel's dream, the end is not really the end of the world at all, but the rise of Israel as a great political power that would subjugate and rule over all the other empires in the world. And this is the, the belief that the early Christians inherited. The Messiah would come as a political leader who would throw off the domination of the Roman Empire and establish his own empire instead. In the book of Acts, when the risen Christ tells the disciples to stay in Jerusalem and wait for baptism of the Holy Spirit, they quite naturally ask them, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And throughout the New Testament, you, you see this questioning. If Jesus was the Messiah, and the Messiah was supposed to restore the political domination of Israel as a country, as an empire, uh, to be a new and greater King David, as it were, why wasn't it happening? But slowly, as you read the New Testament, you can see the Christians, as they read and reread their Bible, our Old Testament, beginning to understand that the end would be a real end, not just the rise of another political power, one favorable to them, but, but a new world, a new heaven and a new earth, a new age. As the author of the book of Revelation puts it, the last book of the Bible, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bar, pride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold, the home of God is with men and women. He will go with them as their God. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. And he will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither crying, nor pain, nor sorrow any longer for the former things will have passed away. Now, of course, they, they still thought, even though they began to realize this would be much larger than just the rise of Israel as a, as a renewed power, they still thought uh, uh, that they could figure out when this would be, if they poured over the same to Jesus that I read or some of the prophecies in the Old Testament, without really taking into account uh, Jesus' own words of warning about that day where I ended that passage with his comment, but of that day no one knows, neither the angel in heaven, nor even the Son, but only the Father. And many Christians throughout the millennium and centuries, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, have not taken into account Jesus' words either. As they figured they had new insights into when this world of ours would end, and saw come forward with dates and predictions. I remember one of the very first pastoral visits I made in First Baptist Church in Kingston, Ontario when I began my ministry there. It was to a church member who stopped coming to church, and so as the new minutes were on the block, I went to visit him to see if I could encourage him, encourage him to come back to church. After an hour and a half monologue of when the world would end, because he certainly understood, he said all the insights in the book of Revelation, he claimed to know right down to the very hour when Christ returned. I left his home not really as eager as I was before, to see him return to church. <laughs> but even though Jesus tells us we cannot and do not know when the end will come, and should not be so hubristic as to think we know when Jesus himself saying not to know, I think we can discern something of the flow of human history. Indeed, we're called by Jesus to do so himself. When he castigated the Pharisees, for being able to determine the weather by the signs in the skies, but not being willing or able to discern the signs of the time. And the signs of the times, I believe, are pointing to an ending 
of some sort. Not the end of the world, but an ending of some sort. The American empire under whose shadow we have li lived for so long is losing its dominance globally. And according to an interesting scholar named Peter Turchin, it's entering a period of destabilization. In a series of books and articles, Turchin, who's not a Christian, although sympathetic to the Christian faith, claims that all complex societies alternate between periods of stability and peace and periods of instability and outbreaks of violence. Turchin wrote to frame with in 2010 as a professor in the United States, he predicted that by 2020 there would be violence in the United States. And when the Capitol building was attacked as a reaction to Trump's electoral loss on January 6, 2021, many people began to discover Turchin's writings and seek his advice. Now, while I disagree, while I disagree with Turchin's overweening confidence that he can accurately predict periods of disintegration, and that reminded me of that a church a member I visited. I am in agreement with the reasons he puts down in his book for why societies begin to disintegrate. Although I'd add one more, and that is a falling away from any sort of spiritual anchor. But church doesn't have that as an odd Christian. What he has are four factors why complex societies begin to unrival. The first is popular immiseration, which simply means the growth of a large percentage of the population who are poor. The second is elite overproduction, by which he means that there are too few positions of wealth and power and too many people trying to get into such positions and being unable to do so and therefore becoming bitter and angry. Number three, the failing legitimacy of the state, where a growing number of people do not accept the state's authority in taxation or in legal matters. And then number four, external geopolitical factors. And of these four factors, Churchill claims that the first two, which are most important in seeking some sort of disintegrative period. And the unnerving thing for me in reading these four factors about why complex societies unravel uh, in Churchill's book is that in Canada today, both of these factors are, are quite evident. The gap between rich and poor in Canada grew last year faster than at any time in our nation's history. The middle class is shrinking, and there are growing number of people today who are barely getting by day by day, and who are frustrated and angry. Moreover, the opportunities for advancement for becoming part of what church and labels as the elite are shrinking as well. A recent Globe and Mail article featured several students in Ontario who had failed to get into high paying uh, university programs even though they had grades of 95% because there weren't enough positions to go around. Such people become, church and right, the leaders of violence and revolution. They rouse up the growing number of poor people who revolt and they overthrow the government. Now, if it was just Peter Turchin sounding the alarm, we might not be so, so concerned, but others are speaking out as well. An Economist magazine podcast that I was listening to just the other day made the claim that not just the United States and Europe are experiencing troubles, but that the whole world is in a period of crisis due to the war in the Ukraine and the fact of nuclear war will change over all of us, the COVID pandemic and the assurance that more pandemics are coming, the impact of global warming on our natural world and the threat to food production, the rise of China and the growth of dictatorial power not only in China but in many nations throughout the world, the growing uh, gap between the haves and the have-nots not only in our country but in the world. And then uh, this Economist podcast added another threat which I really wasn't that concerned about, although Mark has been more concerned about it, and that's the growth of artificial intelligence, or AI, as it's popularly known. A friend of mine who's well studied in these issues that are challenging us these days, uh, and more besides, drops over to ask the plaintive question to me now and then, where is God in the midst of all these troubles? Where is God when the society in which one lives is going through a period of instability, as I believe we are now. 
And I would like to answer, answer to him that God will magically save our society from going through such troubles. I know that's what he wants me to say. But when I read my Bible, I don't see God magically rescuing us from our self-inflicted problems. The Israelite nation went through trouble after trouble, some of their own making, some due to powerful neighbors to the north, to the south, who wanted to take their land. But that doesn't mean, as Christians, we should give up all hope. So let me close with two hopeful things that we must remember in this time of challenge and change. And the first is never to underestimate the influence of a small group of people. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole loaf. And one single candle is set on a hill can give light to many. What we do here at Parole Baptist Church, in this small community of ours, in this small church of ours now, what we do in our music, in our women's group, in our Sunday breakfast, in our different programs, Christian education may seem insignificant to some of them, but we are heaven, which makes the whole community better. We are light, which testifies to a better way to the triumph of God's love, to the importance of caring for each other and caring for all people. In Bolivia, South America, where I grew up, there is a small town named Guajajata, which is perched right beside Lake Titicaca, the highest navigable lake in the navigable lake in the world. Back in the 1930s, it was the site of a large farm which the Canadian Baptist Foreign Mission Board, as it was at that time, bought with money from all over Canada, including, I'm sure, money from Pro Baptist Church. Only to discover to their horror that when they bought the farm, they bought the people on the farm as well as slaves. Not wanting to be slave owners, um, they told the people that if they learned to farm the land, that over a period of three years, they would give the land back to them. They did that. And some 25 or more years later, that example of land reform became the impetus for the whole country of Bolivia to begin the process of land reform where just a few people owned all the land to divide it up among the people, first in Bolivia and then in the country of Mexico. Never underestimate the influence of a group of small people to make things better. And then in second instance, another thing for hope in this time of change is the assurance that God is always with us, even when things are difficult. Always God walks beside us, even in the valley of the shadow of death, as the psalm puts it, where others cannot go. God is with us. The Paul Footprints, which you know well, I'm sure, puts it like this. One night I dreamed a dream as I was walking along the beach with my own. Across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonging to me and one to my Lord. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand and I noticed that many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you walked with me all the way, but I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, I love you and will never leave you. Never, ever during your times of trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. As the author Taylor Caldwell puts it, we are never alone. Not when the night is darkest, the world coldest, the world seemingly most indifferent. For this is still the time that God chooses. Our hymn is number 86. The Lord is my shepherd.
And now may the road rise to meet you, may the wind be at your back, may the sun shine warm down your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you safely in the hollow of his hand. Thank you.